Hello and welcome back to HUD's two-day environmental training. Uh, before we launch into it, I'd like to introduce a new panel member, Laura Myers. Uh, Laura, to my left, uh, is the environmental compliance officer for Fort Worth, Texas, Region 6. Um, coming back, uh, myself, Frederick Shaw, multifamily appraiser, Stefan Tomatos to my right, um, and Liz Zapata. We're going to uh, start with general requirements, map guide chapter 9. Um, I have to tell you this uh, had been uh, about 60 slides and over the course of the last several months and peer review it's been cut down so this is more of an overview, a summary. Chapter 9 is what the uh, appraisers in the field uh, use as their Bible. It's about uh, 40 to 50 pages long and uh, pretty much it has everything that we need to know uh, to guide us in our environmental review process. Um, it d does define the procedures uh, that the lenders and HUD staff uh, utilize. Um, it requires that the lender make certain um, application submissions and follow up as requested by HUD. And this is really where the lender is responsible. Um, we are the reviewers and the analysts. Uh, the lenders um, have their side of it and we should be always working through them, uh, going back to them, asking questions not doing their work for them. Uh, they know, most of them know the uh, Chapter 9 uh, guide as well as we do, um, and that's their side of the uh, equation. HUD staff is responsible for completing the environmental review. Um, it's very easy to use uh, the lender's review. Very often they'll give us a HUD 4128 sample field notes checklist. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer if we just utilize that. Uh, copy uh, and say that we've come to our own conclusions. What you really want to do is um, trust the lender but verify the information and if you're going through the uh, compliance steps yourself um, coming up with the map you find out where uh, there may be errors in their presentation um, and it corrects our environmental review. Um, we come up with independent analysis and what that really means is independent review so that our conclusions are our own, uh, not conclusions already arrived at um, by the lender. Obviously, if we're in concurrence with the lender, there's nothing wrong with that, but um, in your heart, you should really know that you've done uh, your environmental due diligence. Trust but verify. Map Guide Chapter 9 um, is set up in the same five uh, mm -hmm. section, sections, uh, 9.1 through 9.5. Um, it had gone to this format in 2011, so we did have risk-based mitigation back then. Um, section 1 is an introductory. Section 2 is procedures. Um, section uh, 3, 9.3, contamination analysis, uh, phase 2, and risk-based corrective action. Um, Section uh, 9.4, again, we go into HUD uh, staff responsibilities, but in reviewing um, case studies and remediation, and uh, section 9.5 is uh, the environmental report. And sorry, here it is. For the most part, I'm going to be talking about 9.1 and 9.2, mainly because 9.3, contamination analysis, is going to be possibly for next year. Um, this is where we get into risk-based corrective action. Phase 2 is higher level analysis. Um, if you see something like this, if the lender is um, supporting this in their submission, it's probably going to go or start with uh, an appraiser, and they can certainly walk uh, through the application process with you. Uh, and Chapter 9 compliance, but um, 9.3 and 9.4, we're going to, going to be hitting that pretty hard um, with other presenters. The, envir the environmental report, um, there was a time when the lenders basically submitted something uh, in addition to the Phase 1, um, and this was their uh, submission requirement. These are NEPA. Uh, rules and regulations and compliance factors. Um, we're seeing those now more incorporated into the phase one. Nine point one. Um, Liz talked about NEPA. Uh, we have our HUD handbooks. These are older handbooks, uh, thirteen ninety point two and point four. Um, if you can get hold of them, they give you a good working knowledge of what you should and shouldn't be doing when you're uh, doing your site inspection, um, reliance on um, outside authorities, 
um, versus what your uh, eyes and ears see when you're on the site. Um, I think it's still valuable uh, and it's going to help your site in, uh, inspection. Um, and if you can uh, get a chance to grab these, I would. Uh, the HUD form 4128 has been replaced by Heroes. It's an electronic version of the 4128. Um, it's more streamlined. It takes some getting used to, and um, there's some best practices that we'll try to recommend uh, during our presentation. Sample field notes checklist is also, uh, there's a component in Heroes that does that. However, um, I would urge you to uh, utilize one of the older versions uh, and take it out into the field. It helps you focus on um, what your field review is going to um, need. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than to come back from the field after um, six hours and find that you've forgotten basic information that you're not going to find anywhere else in the application. Um, we've talked about categorical exclusions, um, uh, the abbreviated or um, summarized version of an environmental assessment uh, that we utilize for <coughs> Um, for 223F purchase refinancing and for 223A7s, um, we'll get more into that. Um, but basically, our level of training, uh, you're going to be, be receiving uh, these applications and somebody else will have checked the compliance. Um, whether the categorical exclusion uh, applies uh, for an A7 or whether it, it, there's a little too much renovation work, over $1,500 per unit, and it should have been uh, an F but that's really beyond the scope of our environmental training. Um, we had an acronym earlier this morning, uh, Local, State, Tribal, and Federal Laws, uh, LSTF. You're going to see that a lot. Um, local and state requirements always apply. Uh, we always follow the stricter standard um, versus federal law um, and obviously be mindful of tribal authority. What tends to happen, and I'll give you an example, um, we had a SHPO review for a project in New Jersey. Um, SHPO is a state uh, agency. They uh, had no determination there, so we were fine. But the locals uh, decided that this was going to be in an environmental uh, historic area. Um, and in trying to work with them, we found out that it uh, then became a zoning approval um, question. So with the locals having authority as to whether our, our uh, project was going forward, uh, this became an issue and we had to resolve it before um, finishing our environmental review. Um, here we talk about categorical exclusions. Uh, I don't want to um, read from the map guide, but 9.1A4 uh, discusses um, 223F purchase or refinance and uh, when we reference Part B, that's on the old HUD 4128. Um, 9.1A5 discusses categorical exclusions uh, for refinance of a HUD-insured mortgage, allowing only routine maintenance. Emphasis here on HUD-insured mortgage. It's already in the HUD portfolio. Um, by definition, uh, that's a 223A7, and it also uh, includes, involves uh, certain 223Fs that have already been um, financed, refinanced, and within the HUD portfolio. Again, um, you've got that $1,500 um, uh, per unit amount of maintenance that would um, give you that criteria. Um, and that's our working definition, by the way, of routine maintenance. Um, radon, lead-based paint, and asbestos um, fall within uh, uh, these categories. Uh, they're not new to the map guide, but uh, there's a newer emphasis on them. Radon um, uh, was put into uh, the latest map guide, but we were compliant with the radon mitigation notice from 2013. Lead to base paint and asbestos were already in uh, the 2011 version. Um, in Heroes, they are handled um, uh, within a 223F, uh, so you're going to be discussing those. Um, nuisances and hazards, uh, somewhat new for this map guide. We're dealing with pipelines, fall distances, and oil and gas wells. Um, it's, it used to be part of uh, Part B, but uh, there may be instances where you're handling it uh, now under an, uh, 223F. Going into the procedures, uh, Stefan uh, lit briefly on this. Uh, for all projects submitted under MAP and 
Um, these are MAP uh, compliant. Um, the lender must, uh, at the pre-app stage, give us a phase one with any uh, supporting contamination documents. Again, the environmental report, uh, NEPA factors, unless the project is categorically excluded, they're going to deal with lead-based paint, asbestos, and radon. We'll get into the particulars um, uh, later on in the presentation uh, as to when that's applicable or not applicable. Um, and obviously other documents requested by HUD. Um, what we're finding is that the environmental report is being incorporated into the phase one. Um, we discussed this earlier that uh, the environmental report is not really uh, the area of expertise that the environmental professionals have. Uh, we are considered, uh, in many cases, the knowledge experts, so read that carefully. Um, I've found that when there's going to be errors in the phase one, it's likely going to be in that area. Um, larger phase one environmental firms have been incorporating this. Um, a takeaway here is that these larger um, countrywide firms don't always have local uh, knowledge and experience. Um, and again, coming out of field offices where you're working uh, in various states, you may have a better knowledge base than they do. Uh, so keep that uh, in mind when you're doing your review. Um, when in doubt, uh, it is the lender's responsibility to um, provide all necessary documentations. Um, there's some back and forth on this. Uh, an example might be when um, I happen to have a, a good working relationship with my New Jersey SHPO office, and if it's only going to uh, take a phone call to get an answer, do I really want to go to the lender who's going to go to the environmental professional who's going to go to SHPO and then back up the chain in order to give me a letter that uh, should have been in the file and is likely just uh, lagging behind? Um, but for all other substantial issues, um, particularly if it's going to be documented as a deficiency. Um, this is something that you're going to be dealing with uh, the lender and you're going to be going through your underwriter um, uh, with deficiency responses. Uh, the lender, of course, has uh, response time. Um, we talked uh, earlier about uh, completing the environmental review early. Uh, again, we have our own timelines. I'll just remind you of them, 45 days for a 223F um, purchase refinance and 60 days for new construction and sub rehab. Um, so we do try to get the environmental review done early. Uh, we start it uh, almost as soon as it hits our desk. Um, SHPO has a 30-day review requirement and it's not 30 days from when they get it, it's 30 days from when they find it accept acceptable. Uh, with that in mind, uh, your 45 days gets awfully short. Um, if you're at the last 15 days and you have to go to loan committee and SHPO hasn't responded and you're not quite sure why. Um, going into Section 9.2 procedures, um, from the time of, of initial contact with HUD until the environmental uh, review is complete, there are certain limited activities. Initial contact um, uh, at the concept meeting, uh, pre-app, Application submission meetings or correspondence with HUD staff or lender to prepare an application for uh, multifamily housing. Um, we deal with prohibitive activities. Uh, we've had hit that already, but basically anything that limits our uh, choices, um, such as taking down a historic building because you're talking to a commercial bank and now you want to bring it into HUD, we're going to be looking at that um, um, as, as an adverse uh, environmental impact. And we're going to wonder how much the lender and their uh, owner developer knew prior to submitting to HUD. Uh, that in itself, uh, if we feel that they were negligent or should have known this and didn't, uh, could lead automatically to an environmental reject. Um, Stefan talked about hiring um, qualified professionals and consulting early with regional staff on HUD's environmental requirements. Uh, normally when I get anything over 200 units, um, uh, I don't want to have to have a 30-day review period um, with my field environmental officer, um, somebody like Laura. Um, I'm going to involve her early and often in my decision making and that's going to cut down on the amount of review that she's doing at the end. There aren't going to be uh, 
any any problems, um, any gee, Rick, um, I don't believe that you did this right, um, and it's at the end of the environmental review, and now I have to circle back around. Um, if we're working in tandem, um, not throughout the complete process, but if uh, the environmental compliance officer is up to speed on, on what your concerns are and how you're handling them, uh, just keep them in the, uh, in the loop. HUD staff's responsibilities, we talked about this, independently evaluate all environmental exhibits for compliance, uh, determine whether conditions violate any laws, would endanger health or safety, or would raise financial risk or liability. Um, and again, take action, proactive action, uh, if the lender is found to have or is about to take a pro prohibited uh, action. Um, there is a requirement for HUD uh, staff to make a site visit. It can be the appraiser, the underwriter, or anybody in cost, uh, A&E. Um, it has traditionally been the appraiser, and a little later on we'll talk about uh, the hows and whys of that. Um, you do complete the environmental review. Now it's in HEROES with all appropriate signatures um, uploaded to your branch chief um, and sign, uh, whoever has final signing authority for uh, the underwriting uh, at the firm when we issue the firm. Regional environmental officers, field environmental officers, Officers must review and comment if project uh, is an environmental assessment with over 200 units. Circling back, environmental assessment, we're talking about new construction and certain levels of um, substantial uh, renovation. Um, we list the details, what those circumstances are in 9.2, B, 4, and 5. Um, basically, if you're going to be uh, changing the density or uh, converting units um, so you have greater uh, numbers of units. Um, we also have normally unacceptable uh, noise zones, uh, and that's also uh, generally uh, when you bring in your uh, noise expert. Um, we look at ensuring that all environmental issues are resolved and the environmental review is complete before issuing the firm. We're really dealing with knowns versus unknowns. Um, we don't want to go into issuing the firm and there's any outstanding questions, uh, particularly something that could circle back um, and add to or lead to a, a foreclosure. Um, conditions of the firm at this point um, as we've all learned in transformation, don't uh, necessarily survive the uh, closing. So in many cases, you're going to be putting in information, um, requirements or conditions uh, to the processing that asks for the owner developer to certify certain things will continue after, um, after closing. A mitigation plan, um, if any, in agreement with other documents, um, it's it's up to us to make sure that they uh, survive closing. HEROES gets into that later on when they start asking about the mitigation plan and who's going to be monitoring it. <coughs> Other areas, and I'm going to depart now because I'm not really talking about um, 9.3 and 9.4, uh, and we'll get into 9.5 um, environmental uh, uh, reports later on. Um, so really now I'm going to uh, get away from the map guide and I'm going to talk about timing and by this I'm talking about the workflow. What happens when an application hits your desk um, and you're the underwriter, you've never uh, looked at a phase one, uh, you've looked at uh, the environmental uh, issues in the lender's narrative and um, suddenly you have 1,500, 1,600 pages of a phase one um, and where do you start? Actually, you can start before anything even hits your desk. Pre-concept meetings, um, Stefan used this slide exactly, discuss unusual environmental issues so that nothing comes in as a surprise. Uh, give advice, but don't get too deep. Don't make promises or assurances. Um, I could almost add, don't put anything in writing. Um, the lenders can limit the amount of information coming to you, which would be uh, a limiting factor in your decision. If you put that in writing, you will hear about it later on. Um, again, I would take this time to advise the lender to refrain from making choice limiting decisions and actions. This could be three to six months before the application actually comes in. 
Um, so that would be a good time to talk about um, and give advice on the lender. Uh, make sure that the lender has read and understood the map guide chapter nine. I swear it's surprising how many times they ask rudimentary questions and they're just really looking for a go-to person. Um, the answers are in the map guide. Um, most of the lenders are very conversant in it. They know it as well as we do, but again, they have some underwriter trainees. Um, and our job is to analyze, not to train their people. At the concept meeting, uh, you're going to read the package, understand it as it pertains to us in Chapter 9. Um, I always ask questions about radon, lead-based paint, and asbestos. Uh, lead-based paint and asbestos if the project property building is older than 1978. Um, there may be other relevant issues identified by the lender. Um, and again, I mentioned radon has become a hot-button issue with us. Um, since 2013 in the radon mitigation notice uh, in the field, chances are you are already dealing with radon rules and regulations prior to this because it dealt with the health and safety of the residents. Um, any potential contamination, contamination issue should be dealt with uh, now at the concept meeting and we advise that um, we talk to them before phase two uh, environmental site assessment is prepared. Um, it costs money, uh, it can um, waylay the uh, entire uh, process. We don't know what we're going to find until the phase two comes in. It may be a talking point. Um, it may be that we concur in a phase two isn't necessary. Um, I usually like to emphasize wetlands and floodplains because we have executive orders. Um, nuisances and hazards are now new for the 2016 map guide. Um, they're discussed in, in a greater detail. Um, and very often, if you've got more than 200 units, now is the time at the concept meeting when you would invite the um, field environmental officer in to um, review the package and talk with the lender. Uh, they're going to have final sign-off um, authority uh, after you, so getting them involved early and often is the best scenario. At the pre-app or the firm stage, um, you're going to uh, read the lender's narrative, um, emphasizing on the environmental aspects. What you're really getting here is what the lender wants you to see. Um, I won't call it propaganda, but it is what the uh, lender wants to emphasize and, uh, in certain respects, de-emphasize in other uh, areas. Um, at that application stage, you're going to read the Phase 1 ESA uh, and the supporting documents. And again, if it's incorporated into um, the phase one, you'll read the environmental report. Um, no, you don't have to read 1,700 pages. Uh, yes, you will be um, reading certain aspects of it um, early and later on in the process, and you're going to begin to populate heroes. Um, I used to call that uh, beginning to populate the 4128. It does help you uh, focus on the issues uh, that you're going to be reading in the various lender submissions. Um, at that point also you can begin to set up your site inspection. By the time you go out into the field you should have a working knowledge of what you're likely to see and what the phase one environmental uh, professional has seen during their site inspection. One of the things that I've uh, found is that when you're populating heroes um, it's a good idea to set up an electronic file um, for all of your documents. As an appraiser I, I typically um, go to SharePoint um, put in the lender's narrative, obviously the appraisal in any market studies, um, the phase one. Some lenders in their submissions will break down all of the supporting documents. Um, it's nice to be able to go to a SHPO document and actually see that it's a SHPO document and doesn't refer you back to um, the phase one. Um, working through 1,700 pages is tough and it takes the better part of a morning uh, to upload the maps and supporting documents, but Heroes um, is an electronic environment and it has had its own um, peculiarities. And one of the things is that from the first time you browse and upload a document into Heroes, it takes you to um, a certain file. And if you've already pre-populated that file, uh, you just keep hitting browse and going back to it and pulling your documents out. So if you can pre-populate it, um, it's going to make your Hero screen presentation and working through that process a lot easier.
Site inspections, normally um, three working days is kind of a minimum uh, for courtesy, so I try not to call somebody up on a Friday asking for a Monday or a Tuesday. Um, site inspection, but uh, they have to be flexible as well. Um, budgets are tight, um, cars are not always available. I usually look for uh, a car uh, first, and then I know which days that I can make the inspection. Um, if you're working with other people in your office, other uh, technicians or uh, an underwriter who wants to go out, um, anybody else who needs to be at the site and uh, has the flexibility and timing, that's also when you would um, coordinate and uh, work with applicable dates. First things to look for in a phase one. Um, we're supposed to deal with this standard ASTM E1527-13. It is the most current, um, but by the time you see this training in a, in a year or so, perhaps there's a, an upgraded, uh, updated one, uh, so keep that in mind. Um, what I normally do is I start uh, going through the phase one and I've got a highlighter. And as soon as I see 152713 uh, on the front in their scope of work, um, I trust that they, as the environmental professional, are adhering to that. They are certifying to it. So I don't necessarily uh, jump into the appendices in X2, um, um, which is the preparer's qualifications, X3, the user questionnaire, or X4, the table of contents, to see if they conform with uh, the ASTM standard. But it's in the back of my mind. Um, and there are other factors when you're going through the phase one uh, that will tell you that it's uh, an ASTM compliant report. The date of the report is important. Um, we have 180 days for the most part. Um, those are uh, not working days, those are calendar days. From the earliest date of the records review, interviews, or site visit. Most often we'll find that it's the site visit, but uh, the date on the front of the report is very often the date of completion, so uh, don't worry about that. You'll take a look and they will state what date uh, they visited the site and uh, that starts the countdown. But occasionally you'll find that uh, an EDR data search was run and it may have happened a week to 10 days before the site visit. Obviously the environmental professional is going out there prepared and wants to see uh, what environmentally sensitive uses and contamination issues may be uh, in the neighborhood and impacting our site or if the site is uh, listed in the report. So if that's earlier, then you start the 180-day uh, countdown at that point. Uh, if it's more than 180 days but less than 360, uh, you're looking for an update to the report. Um, and you do want to find out if HUD is listed as an authorized user of the report. This gives you a little bit more credibility uh, to be able to call up the uh, Phase One environmental professional and ask uh, targeted specific questions. Um, as to what they have um, in or not in the report and why they did things. But if it gets uh, too involved, you're going to want to um, bring in uh, HUD staff and the lender because now it may be uh, rising to the level of a deficiency. When I get into the phase two and I'm looking at 1,700 pages, I go right to the beginning. Uh, the summary of the phase one, uh, an executive summary, it um, basically tells you, um, the reader, what uh, the phase one environmental professional is thinking and what, uh, what areas and issues raised to the level of a rec, recognize environmental condition, uh, and in some cases um, where we are in or out of compliance with their own NEPA requirements. Um, I then go to the back of the report, which isn't the back of the appendices, it's uh, it's at the back of uh, the applicable portion, which may be the first 50 to 70 pages. It's usually found just um, obviously in the table of contents and just before their signatures. Um, it's the findings, opinions, and conclusions section of the phase one. It is a requirement for an ASTM compliant uh, phase one to have this. Uh, they can set it up differently, but they will always call it a findings, opinions, and conclusions section. And it is um, a logic tree as to what they found and their opinion as to whether it's relevant or not and their final conclusions as to whether it rises to the level of a rec or does not. And then they'll generally after that um, work with the out of scope issues. Um, when you're looking at the summary and the findings, uh, both of these should be consistent with the lender's narrative, uh, particularly if it's a rec and the lender isn't dealing with it or has somehow overlooked it. At that point then you're going to um, go back into the phase one and read it um, 
from from the beginning until uh, uh, signatures, and you're looking for relevant information and data gaps. Data gaps are roadmaps um, where the environmental professional found that there wasn't enough data. Uh, there was a gap in, um, say, Sanborn maps, historical uses, and they will uh, comment as to whether they are relevant, and basically their uh, word is significant. And at this point, let me just read what uh, a data gap is. Uh, according to the ASTM definition, a data gap is a failure to obtain information required by the ASTM standard despite good faith efforts by the environmental professional. The environmental professional must identify and comment on significant data gaps that affect the conclusions of the report. Um, what is significant? Uh, you can ask five lawyers and they'll give you 20 different reasons and um, scenarios. So it often comes down to what is relevant to their client versus what is relevant to us as the HUD reviewer. Um, that kind of conflict in information um, it really requires us to make an independent analysis and we can come to separate conclusions. Uh, that's where uh, our area of expertise comes uh, into pass. But it's also perhaps a, a good flag opportunity to bring in uh, a knowledge-based resource expert or have a chat with your um, field environmental officer. These are uh, some helpful websites that I've found over the years. Um, again, I go right to uh, the floodplain management uh, because it's an executive order at uh, FEMA.gov and I pull up uh, FEMA Fermet um, and check out uh, whether flood insurance is required. It's easy enough to do. It takes two, three minutes. Um, sometimes they do it the morning of a concept meeting. Um, wetlands, same thing from the National Wetlands Inventory Maps um, on the Fish and Wildlife um, uh, .gov we uh, slash wetlands website. Um, because I was in New Jersey, we had uh, coastal barrier resource and coastal management zones. I pretty much knew where they were, um, but there were times, there were some uh, rules of thumb that uh, uh, went against my knowledge, and if we're doing new construction um, down south of Atlantic City, uh, these were websites that I was going to to make sure that we were in compliance. Again, as a New Jersey requirement, something local that maybe a local lender, um, an environmental professional don't know about, but chances are the architect does, uh, it becomes relevant. And that pretty much uh, finishes my uh, general requirements, um, Map Guide Chapter 9. Um, at this point, um, I'm going to hand it over to Stefan Tomatos for program-specific issues. Stefan? Thank you, Rick. So, okay, yeah, that's, so let's, uh, <clears throat> So I'm going to briefly go through some of the changes that were made to the newest uh, version of the map guide. Uh, it was actually issued in January, but it's in effect since May of this year. Uh, most of these items actually we're going to be talking about in, uh, in, in more detail in the training that we're going to go through for the next uh, half and full day. But uh, I just want to mention the, the, the topics that kind of, uh, oops, all right, so let me go through this. Okay, so this is, okay. Uh, some general notes, uh, there were some, uh, the citations to the, the Form 4128 were removed uh, as we've uh, kind of uh, um, uh, pointed out the, the Heroes, Heroes uh, platform is actually what we're gonna be using uh, now. Uh, also, uh, the map guide requirements uh, versus the laws and authorities and regulatory requirements uh, that's kind of um, highlighted also in the new version of the map, gui map guide. Uh, as uh, I mentioned in the morning, um, there is a very uh, strong distinction that we're making between what we consider to be the map requirements, the map guide requirements versus uh, law authorities and regulatory requirements and how easy it is for us to give, us, give a waiver to one or the other. So one is something we would consider, I'm not saying that we're going to be giving waivers uh, left and right, but it's something we would consider. Uh, it would be a lot more of an issue to get a regulatory waiver, and that's an issue that, that will have to go to the Office of Environment and Energy, CBD. Uh, also, the format is a little more consistent in the new version um, of the map guide, and uh, we try to get uh, rid of some of, the, uh, some of the inconsistencies that were there in the previous one. Uh, 
Uh, in terms of the reference standards, uh, we've updated all the ones that have been updated. So the new standards that are referenced are whatever was in effect um, when the map guide was put together. Um, there is, uh, if there is a standard that hasn't been uh, updated, uh, we still rely on whatever was, uh, uh, was there before. So uh, HUD would require reliance on retired version um, if there is one. Uh, again, the, the HUD, uh, the, the HEROES platform is mentioned, and uh, the issue of professionals. Uh, we are encouraging the use of professionals uh, when the applicant puts together whatever uh, information uh, they're submitting to us. Uh, we kind of uh, um, made a point on the, when we're dealing with lead-based paint, uh, to require that uh, certified lead-based uh, paint risk assessor is used. Um, also, we kind of clear up the language and um, we want to highlight the fact that uh, the references that are in the map guide are there for a reason. Uh, we prefer if people go back and rely on those references rather than just stop at what's in the map guide. Uh, we can't have a complete, um, we can't have a complete um, uh, discussion of whatever is in the reference. That's why uh, we're, 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 we want people to go back to that. Uh, in terms of the asbestos uh, removal, a new version of the map guide requires that asbestos that is, that is friable or damaged must be removed. Uh, we um, understand that this might be a little bit more um, of a challenge. Uh, so we do have an option for a waiver. So for example, if it's uh, as if it's friable and damaged, but it's in an area that uh, typically mechanical room, for example, uh, that typically, typically would not be accessible to um, the occupants of the building, uh, we would uh, consider a, a waiver. In terms of historic preservation, there were some changes and some clarification uh, clarifications that were made. I'm going to leave this for, I think it's this afternoon, we're going to go into this in more detail. And uh, for floodplain management and flood insurance, uh, we just want to make sure that everybody understands that we do not, HUD does not consider any improvements to be incidental. So uh, again, we're going to go through this in a little more detail, but anything that's an, um, an improvement, uh, some pavement or pavement or whatever is not considered incidental, and this is part of the regulation. Wetland protection, we uh, recommend the use of a qualified professional for making uh, that determination if uh, wetlands are on your property or not. Also for endangered species, we, pr um, we kind of uh, expect that the applicant submit enough information for us to make a determination uh, if there is an endangered species issue for a property. Uh, and also HUD is, the, is uh, the, somebody from HUD is, uh, is required to make that contact with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and if there is any additional information that's required. Uh, in terms of noise, uh, we updated kind of the language and some of the definitions. Um, and we, soil source aquifer, we highlight the fact that it is uh, something that's important for us and we are going to have uh, a review if there is a soil source uh, aquifer in a property. In terms of the pipelines, we've uh, removed the reference uh, in, um, in the map guide. Uh, that mentioned that uh, it, it becomes an issue if it's less than 10 feet away from a property, the, the easement for a pipeline. Uh, that was actually removed and what we have now is um, a reference to a document that was put together for HUD and um, the, uh, we're still kind of uh, going through the requirements that are in the document uh, and we'll have um, uh, some further information on this uh, in the future. And that is for the end for uh, the introduction to the map guide and the changes that were made to the map guide. And I think at this point we're... We want to take questions? Yeah, we are ready for questions. Okay, so surprise, no questions. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so we are going to be back Next after... Week. Oh. 11.35 okay. to 11.50, Liz Cepeda, you're up. All right. Yeah, so I'll take us through until lunch, I think, if there's any more questions, or if any questions come in. I don't know if anyone's watching us now. <laughs> Hopefully you're there paying attention. Please send your questions to, uh, to Dan at daniel 
j.sullivan at hud.gov if you do have any questions. We'll be happy to take them. Um, so our next um, step is we're going to take everything we've covered so far and start to apply that to actually the steps of conducting an environmental review. So there's different ways you can think about this. Um, this is kind of how I conceptualize it. Um, so I think of it as three steps. First, you'll need to lay the foundation for your environmental review by defining the project. Then based on the program and the activities involved, you'll determine what type of environmental review you'll do by defining the level of review. And then step three, you'll get into the meat of your review uh, by conducting your analysis and complying with the related laws and authorities, kind of depending on the requirements based on the level of review and the project description. So step one um, is to develop a meaningful project description. Um, a good project description is really crucial. You can't determine the impacts of your project unless you've defined the parameters of that project and what's involved in it. Um, and no one else, whether it's your supervisor, your field environmental officer, the public, or the court, is going to be able to understand your environmental review unless they have a good understanding of what's physically happening. So your project description should include all of these things. Um, location, purpose, need, project beneficiaries, an actual description of the physical impacts, um, your setting, the location, all funding sources, and all development partners. So in HEROES, we have kind of special fields and locations to ensure that you include most of that information somewhere very specific. Um, but the project description should touch on all of those things. And if you've used HEROES, you know if there's one big text box where we ask you to put in your project description. Um, so most important to make sure you include in that text box is all activities, um, all, a physical description of all existing or proposed new buildings, time frames for implementation, and the size and scope of the project. Um, just from a technical perspective, if you're in Heroes and you've got a giant document and you can't fit it all in that text box, feel free to upload something. Um, you know, it's okay if you upload it in the place for a map or a site visit and just reference it because we know that we're asking for a lot of information here. Um, but you should make sure that somewhere on that project summary screen, you're getting all this information in there. I've kind of alluded to this several times, um, but here's the actual definition of project aggregation. Under part 50.21, HUD must group together and evaluate as a single project all individual activities that are related either geographically or as logical parts of a composite of comp contemplated activities. So we're looking at all actions involved in the project, um, not just a building, but also the parking lot, the entrance and exits to that lot, um, any landscaping, any infrastructure, all the geographically and logically related parts of the whole. Um, you want to kind of think of the project holistically. Uh, that helps us catch all the impacts and issues that might arise and helps us foresee and avoid potential conflicts and potential problems. A little terminology note here. Again, people can do this differently, but just so we're on the same page, what I'm going to be doing is uh, when I refer to an activity, I'm referring to a kind of discrete action, like acquiring a property, demolishing an existing building, rehabilitating infrastructure, uh, constructing a new multifamily building, each of those uh, is one activity. Um, then a project is all of the aggregated activities that accomplish an objective or make up that logical whole. Um, so a project might be all four of those actions put together, or it might just be one action. It just depends on the scale, uh, what's going on in this particular example. So just to give an example, if you're looking at a new multifamily housing development on an undeveloped site, um, you might see the project is just constructing housing. Um, but you should also be thinking about all of the other things that go into that development, so like the infrastructure. Um, whether all these aspects are funded by community development block grants or by home, PIH capital funds, non-federal funds altogether, uh, they're all part of this aggregated project description. So your objective 
um, should be to have a project description that considers all activities and funding sources for the activities kind of taking place at that location at that time. This can get tricky when you're looking at phased reviews or phased projects. Um, if multiple phases are anticipated, uh, the project description should consider all the phases that are reasonably foreseeable. So in some cases, you'll evaluate all phases together. Um, that might be appropriate if kind of the, the activities that are taking place at this point in time depend upon a later phase of activity um, being completed. If they're all you know, intrinsically tied up together, that might be one project description. Um, however, if the later phases may or may not follow, then you might want to consider those in separate environmental reviews. Um, those further phases might be indirect or cumulative impacts of, your fa of the current phase, um, but they might not be within the same project description. I know that's a little gray. Um, this isn't always easy defining your project description. You might want to pull in technical support, pull in your field environmental officer, and discuss what's appropriate in terms of what should be involved in your current project description. And then it really is possible to over-aggregate and include too many activities in a project description just to make sure this is as difficult as possible. Um, we see this most often when multiple activities are sharing a source of funds or are being processed together by the program office. So you might think you need to evaluate them in a single in environmental review, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, so for purposes of your environmental review, the financial aspects really aren't that important. Um, there are cases where there'll be a one-to-one -one relationship between you know, one environmental review for one loan, one grant, one transaction, whatever it is. Um, but when you're defining your project, you wanna kind of take off your financial lenses and, and think about it from more of a physical perspective. Um, so we'll give a couple of examples because this is hard to, to speak about abstractly. Um, something we see a lot with RAD transaction um, is that they'll be demolishing a building on one site and then building a new kind of replacement building and that will be kind of thought of as the same transaction. So if you're building the new building on the same lot, you're demolishing a building and building a new one in the same exact location, that's one project with two activities, demolition and new construction. If you're building the replacement building a mile away, then that's kind of two environmental reviews. Um, you'll find it's a lot easier to evaluate those sites separately uh, than to try to juggle them within the same analysis because they're gonna have different maps, different contamination, maybe one's in a floodplain and one isn't. Um, a good rule is to kind of evaluate multiple sites together within a single environmental review if they're so near each other that all environmental issues um, are gonna be substantially the same. So if they're on contiguous sites, same environmental review, if there's a substantial space between them, separate environmental reviews. Um, another example uh, that came up in our New York training um, is if there's a parking lot that's kind of off-site and going to be used by residents of an apartment building. If it's being added at the same time as the multifamily housing, then that's probably part of the same project um, and they should be evaluated together, included in the same project description. But if there's an existing lot that's just nearby, happens to be useful to residents, then that's not really part of the scope of this project. You might want to mention it, but it's not within the project description. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's it for project description. Um, and now we'll move on to our next step is going to uh, using that project description to determine your level of review. Um, this de step determines how in-depth your review has to be and what steps you're going to take to complete it, how long it takes to finish your review. Uh, under Part 50, we have four levels of review. Um, we've touched on this before. The highest is an Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS. Um, these are relatively unusual at HUD projects. Usually, we don't do things that are this big, um, but they do come up a few times a year. Um, especially for disaster recovery projects, you'll see that a lot, uh, which doesn't come up for you all. <laughs> uh, the next level is the environmental assessment, or EA. 
Um, you'll see these quite often for multifamily housing. Uh, then we have two types of categorical exclusion. Uh, there's categorically excluded subject to 50.4 and categorically excluded not subject to 50.4. Um, so I'm going to try to avoid acronyms, but this means you're going to have to deal with me stumbling over some very clunky terminology like categorically excluded, not subject to 50.4. Um, so a categorical exclusion defines a type of activity that doesn't require an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement unless extraordinary circumstances apply. Um, and our regulations list very specific activities that are categorically excluded. Now, regardless of which level applies to the project in question, uh, this determination must be made by HUD and must be made in writing. Timelines can vary substantially, and it's going to mostly come down to your level of review, how long a review takes. Um, an environmental impact statement, or EIS, is going to take one or two years. Um, an environmental assessment, we're looking at a couple months, three months uh, to complete. It kind of depends on what kind of consultation is required. Uh, categorically excluded subject to 50.4, these reviews take a month or two, uh, three. Uh, depends a lot, depending, again, on, on the consultations required and the specifics of the project. Um, and then categorically excluded, not subject to 50.4, we're looking at like an hour. So this table, which hopefully you can read, uh, shows how the levels of review correspond to multifamily housing programs. You all are really lucky and I think unique in that these break down almost exactly on program lines. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out of determining your level of review. On the lowest end, there's the 223A7s, which are categorically excluded, not subject to 50.4. Um, the reason 223A7s are in this very smallest group is that, um, or the lowest group, <laughs> is that they're already in HUD's portfolio, so an environmental review has already been completed, and they don't include any rehab or repairs beyond routine maintenance. So of the 16 laws and authorities listed in 50.4, 223A7s only need to document compliance with flood insurance. Uh, we have, to take, have them take a second look at floodplains uh, because floodplains may have shifted since the previous environmental review, so we want to make sure that's up to date. Uh, but everything else, we assume that it isn't going to be triggered um, by a 223A7. Now, I understand that there are also some 223Fs that are kind of in this same position uh, where they're previously HUD insured and only routine maintenance is involved. And in that case, those projects would also be categorically excluded, not subject to 50.4. Um, and we're going to go into more detail on each of these levels of review in a few minutes. This is just our overview to get us oriented. Uh, the next level would be the 223F, uh, which is generally categorically excluded subject to 50.4. Uh, since these are new to the HUD portfolio, they need a new environmental review. And in addition, since these projects might include minor rehab and repairs in addition to routine maintenance, that will also increase the level of review. So these types of projects must document compliance with all 16 related environmental laws listed in 50.4. Um, as well as the additional requirements in the MAP guide. So you might know that as part A of the 4128. The highest level of review that you'll generally see for multifamily housing is the environmental assessment, which is always required for 221D4 projects. Um, environmental assessments are required for major rehab and new construction projects. So for reference, our regulations have some very specific definitions of the difference between minor categorically excluded rehab versus major rehab, which requires an environmental assessment, um, particularly how that applies to multifamily housing. Um, and you're welcome to take a look at that. But because our definition of major rehab is very similar to the line that would differentiate a 221D4 from a 223F, uh, we're going to assume that all 221D4s require an environmental assessment. Um, so the same applies to all other multifamily new construction and substantial rehab programs. 
um, including apparently 220, 231, 241A, 213, and 207M. I have no additional information on those programs. Um, because these are potentially, or these are bigger projects with potentially more significant environmental impacts than, um, than, than the 223F, these projects require a full environmental assessment and full NEPA analysis, uh, which you might know as parts A and B of the 4128. I know that was a lot of information and it was really technical. Uh, so we're gonna back up for a minute and look at each level of review in detail. So um, again, at HUD, we have two types of categorical exclusions, and these are actions that don't individually or cumulatively have a significant impact on the human environment, unless extraordinary circumstances apply. Um, and because of that, they don't require full NEPA processing, which would be the environmental assessment. Um, so this applies again to 223A7s and 223Fs. Um, so breaking down the- Certain, certain 223Fs. Well, this is categor all categorical exclusions. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now we're going to break it down further. See, this is why I'm going very slowly and repetitively. <laughs> um, so we're going to start at the lowest level, categorically excluded, not subject to 50.4. Um, we'll notice this is color-coded, so we're calling this lowest level this kind of acid green. Um, so this applies, um, well, Let's back up. So our regulations at 5019B21, sorry, there's a typo on this slide, it's B21, um, define refinances of HUD-insured mortgages as categorically excluded, not subject to 50.4, if they will not allow new construction or rehab, nor result in any physical impacts or changes except for routine maintenance. So 5019B defines a couple dozen more activities as categorically excluded, not subject to 50.4 as well, uh, but that's really the only one that matters for you all in this audience. Uh, basically, if your project fits this definition, um, it's categorically excluded, not subject to 50.4, and the only compliance that's required is with flood insurance requirements. Um, so that should be, again, the case for all 223A7s, as well as a very small group of 223Fs. Uh, so you might be wondering what we mean by routine maintenance, um, and we'll cover that in a few minutes over the course of a few slides. 223A7s should go into HEROES, um, so I'm going to give you a few slides worth of how that will look. Uh, this is the level of review determination screen that you get after you do your project description. Um, this lists all of our categorical exclusions in Part 50, uh, and it's a very long list. So if you're reviewing a 223A7, jump down towards the end of the list uh, to 5019B21. I had to cut out a middle of the screen so that we can see it on one slide. Uh, but this is basically what your selection will look like. Now once you've made that selection, um, HEROES knows that the only compliance requirement is for 223A7s is with flood insurance, um, so you'll be routed to this screen. It's an abbreviated version of Part A with only the one law you need to comply with. So now as promised, uh, we'll define what we mean by routine maintenance. Again, this matters because if you're refinancing a HUD-insured mortgage, um, you get to do this very abbreviated environmental review, but only if there are no physical impacts or changes beyond routine maintenance. Um, we have the assumption that the $1,500 a unit limit uh, will keep 223A7s within this limit of routine maintenance, um, but it should be kept in mind. And it's imperative that this is followed um, if you want to treat a 223F as categorically excluded, not subject to. You'll have to make sure that it fits into the definition of routine maintenance. Um, so we have a notice um, that was just issued this year that defines maintenance. It's known as CPD 1602. Um, and if you might want to take a look at it in more detail, um, it defines maintenance specifically for purposes of the environmental review and defining your level of review. But it does apply throughout the entire department um, you know, to public housing, housing, as well as CBD. 
So maintenance activities are activities that slow or halt the deterioration of a building, but do not materially add to its value or adapt it to new uses. So examples of routine maintenance would be cleaning, uh, protective or preventative measures to keep a building, its systems, and its grounds in working order, uh, replacement of appliances that are not permanently affixed to the building, as well as periodic replacement of a limited number of component parts of a building feature that are subject to normal wear and tear, or replacement of a damaged or malfunctioning component part of a building feature or a system. However, replacement of all or most of an entire system would not be maintenance. Um, and here's just an excerpt from that notice. Um, if you look at the notice, it goes through kind of every component of a building um, and distinguishing between the types of activities that would be maintenance versus the types of activities uh, that would not meet our maintenance definition and would in fact be categorically excluded subject to 50.4 rehabilitation. Um, so in the context of a roof, uh, fixing a leak, applying a waterproof coating, um, replacement of uh, flashing or, or loose or missing shingles or tiles would all be considered maintenance. However, complete replacement of the roof with new shingles, new tiles, um, a new roof or installation of solar panels would all be rehabilitation and would be categorically excluded subject to 50.4. Um, so I recommend taking a look at that. There's, I think, pages of these examples where you can see kind of very specific examples back and forth, and it, it really helps give clarity on this. So our next level of review is categorically excluded subject to 50.4. Um, again, our regulations at 5020 define a number of activities that fall into this category, uh, but there are only two that we really have to worry about for this training. Um, there's minor rehabilitation, which our, def our regulations define as uh, rehabilitation of multifamily residential structures where the unit density does not change by more than 20%, there is no change in land use, and the cost of rehab is less than 75% of the replacement cost after rehab. Um, we also have a categorical exclusion specifically for uh, refinances under Section 223F. Um, so this one's clean. <laughs> Basically, any 223F will fall into this category unless, as discussed, uh, they were previously HUD insured and include only routine maintenance. Uh, 223F is the only multifamily housing program where this should apply. So projects that are categorically excluded subject to 50.4 um, are subject to the requirements in 50.4, uh, which means they have to comply with all the laws and authorities listed here in 50.4. Um, so this is Contamination and Toxic Substances, Coastal Zone Management Act, um, Executive Order 12898 on Environmental Justice. There's 16 of these all together. Um, and these are what we'll spend kind of all of this afternoon and tomorrow morning going through all of these requirements. However, these types of activities are categorically excluded um, from a full NEPA review, which means the consideration of alternatives, cumulative impacts, and other factors that are required under NEPA, um, aka Part B of the 4128, uh, do not apply to these types of projects. And Laura will go into those requirements tomorrow afternoon, I think. So this is how a 223F looks in HEROES, um, a little bit of it. Um, if we go to that kind of same level of review screen, if you scroll about halfway down, that's where you can select uh, that a project is categorically excluded subject to 50.4. Um, so for a 223F, if there's rehabilitation involved, you'd select rehab, multifamily rehab, um, and then that exclusion specifically for 223Fs. Then after making that selection, uh, you'll be directed to this screen, which kind of recreates part A of the 4128. Uh, if you haven't used HEROES yet, the biggest difference is that you don't just fill in this screen the way you filled in the 4128. Um, you click on each of these laws and authorities in the left column, and then we'll fill in an individual screen for each of those compliance factors. So as you complete those individual screens, uh, this summary screen will fill in based on your responses on the individual screens.
There are circumstances where a project that would normally be categorically excluded requires a full NEPA review, um, and that's when extraordinary circumstances apply. So this would be the case if the project is precedent setting, somehow similar to actions that normally require an environmental assessment, um, something that would be likely to alter existing HUD policy or something with unusual physical conditions that might have the potential for a significant impact, um, or environmental conditions that could have a significant impact um, on users of the facility. So at the conclusion of your analysis in HEROES, you'll be asked to make a determination about whether extraordinary circumstances apply um, and if the project should be elevated to a higher level of review. So, of course, in most cases, there will not be extraordinary circumstances, and you'll say there are no extraordinary circumstances that would require completion of an EA. Um, if your project is somehow extraordinary, then you'll have to elevate it to an environmental assessment. So our next level of review is the Environmental Assessment, or EA. Uh, the purpose of an environmental assessment is to determine whether the project will have a significant impact on the human environment. So environmental assessments conclude with a finding. Um, if at the conclusion of your environmental assessment you make a finding of significant impact, then an environmental impact statement is required. Uh, however, if HUD makes a finding of no significant impact, then the analysis is complete. Uh, this is known as a FONSI, and it will generally be the last thing you do and the end of an environmental assessment. The environmental assessment is kind of the default. Um, so if all of the activities included in a project are not listed in a categorical exclusion, then an environmental assessment is required by default. Uh, but generally, all 221 D4s and all substantial rehab and new construction programs, again, will require an environmental assessment. In addition to the laws and authorities listed in 50.4, or Part A, uh, environmental assessments must also complete a full NEPA review. Um, in the Office of Environment, we call this the EA factors or the EA analysis. Um, you might also know it as Part B of the 4128. Another procedural requirement for environmental assessments that we have touched upon a couple of times is that if they affect over 200 units, then the field or regional environmental officer with jurisdiction over the project area must be given the opportunity to review and comment on the environmental assessment. This can be fairly time consuming, um, so be sure to account for that. They'll go through your full environmental review record and all your documentation. Um, as Dan mentioned, this is and can be an iterative process. They might ask you to come back and fill in more details where they were lacking, so allow plenty of time. Um, I think Dan requested 30 days for this. That's, that's a good way of making sure you're building in enough time for all of this back and forth that might be necessary. Um, so this is how 221 D4s will look in HEROES. Uh, choosing the level of review is easy. Um, there's no categorical exclusion to a select, so you just select environmental assessment, um, unless extraordinary circumstances apply. Um, then your next stage would be to fill in Part A, the same as you do on a categorically excluded subject to review. Um, and then environmental assessments or 221 D4s will also have to complete these additional screens specifically for uh, environmental assessment level of review. So um, you'll go be routed to this screen to complete kind of part B, uh, the additional analysis required of environmental assessments. And then at the conclusion of all of your analysis and review, you'll either make a find you'll make a finding, either a finding of no significant impact, a FONSI, or a finding of significant impact. Uh, this is what the certifications or signatures look like in HEROES. Um, this looks the same for all levels of review, but uh, we'll take a look at it here. So as the preparer, you'll uh, certify the review by checking these check boxes, filling in your name, and pressing the certify button. You'll then route the review to your supervisor to do the same. If it's an environmental assessment with over 200 units, it will also go to the environmental clearance officer, the regional or field environmental officer. Um, this is blocked off with privileges, so only uh, our field staff can complete this section. Um, and then finally, it will go to the approving official, uh, which will be the person who signs the firm commitment to do the final certification that marks the review complete. <laughs> 
Our last level of review is the environmental impact statement. Uh, this is going to be a very long document prepared only for projects that are found to have a significant impact um, on the quality of the human environment. And again, these are going to take one to two years to complete. There are three situations where an environmental impact statement is required for HUD projects. Uh, first, if the project is found to have a potentially significant impact, um, typically that finding would be made at the conclusion of an environmental assessment. Um, our noise regulations also require completion of an environmental impact statement if a noise sensitive use such as housing is located in the unacceptable noise range. And if a project exceeds HUD's regulatory threshold of 2,500 or more units or beds, then it automatically requires an environmental impact statement. Um, if this comes up, definitely pull in the assistance of an expert um, because an environmental impact statement is a huge undertaking. So just kind of in summary, <laughs> this is the requirement for each level of review and program type. Uh, 223A7s are categorically excluded, not subject to 50.4. Uh, with the exception of flood insurance requirements. 223Fs are categorically excluded subject to 50.4, so they have to do kind of part A of the 4128. 221D4s uh, are require an environmental assessment, which requires both parts A and part B of the 4128, as well as a FONSI. And environmental impact statements, uh, which would come up most likely for anything with 2,500 or more units or beds, um, requires all of that and the White House Council on Environmental Quality's additional requirements of environmental impact statements, which we're not going to bother going into today because they're relatively rare. Whew. So now we're ready to get into step three, the meat of actually complying with all of the related laws in 50.4 or part A. Uh, so we'll spend the rest of today and kind of all of tomorrow morning on this section. Uh, so to recap, any project that is categorically excluded subject to 50.4 as well as environmental assessments and environmental impact statements, uh, everything except for 223A7s is going to have to comply with all of these. Um, early tomorrow morning, or tomorrow afternoon, we're also going to cover part B, which only applies to environmental assessments and environmental impact statements. Uh, but for each of these 16, uh, HUD must consider and al analyze all documents provided in the environmental report, uh, confirm that all of these documents uh, demonstrate compliance, um, follow up if you need any additional documentation, and certify that the project complies with all requirements. So partners and third-party providers can assist in gathering data, certain documents, certain analysis, but it's HUD that's ultimately responsible for making sure that all of these this is in compliance, uh, making sure that everything is complete and accurate, and taking certain steps that only HUD or a federal actor can do. So these are the 16 laws and authorities listed in 50.4 uh, that all HUD projects must comply with. Um, and then chapter nine imposes additional requirements for multifamily housing projects. Um, and these will go into your environmental reviews uh, beyond just what's required in part 50. And we'll be covering those as well. I think mostly Rick will be covering most of those requirements for us. So that's it for my section. I think we're about on time for today. Um, we have few minutes if we want to take a few questions, if any questions have come in. <laughs> All right. I think we saw a couple questions flashing by. <laughs> OK, great. Um, yes. So. Um, the slides in the presenter refer to re routine maintenance. Many of our 223Fs now are doing a lot more than what we would consider routine maintenance, but they do not rise to the level of substantial rehabilitation. Are these types of transactions also categorically excluded? Yes, those are just regular 223Fs, sounds like. Um, and those are categorically excluded subject to 50.4. Uh, 
Um, so it's possible for a 223F to have an even lower level of review um, and be treated like a 223A7. Uh, but in general, we would expect a regular 223F to be kind of minor rehab, and it would be categorically excluded subject to the 16 laws and authorities in 50.4 or Part A of the 4128. So that's typical, what we would expect. Okay, we have another question about aggregation. When considering aggregation, do you consider when amenities, such as use of a nearby gym, are those considered part of the project? We kind of touched on this a little bit with the parking area. If it is going to be built for the project, then yes, you would consider it with the environmental review. If it is something that is already there and it is not going to be built with this project, then it would be separate. Uh, if it's just a membership that's going to be going with the, uh, the, uh, the lease of a unit, that's something separate and apart and it wouldn't be included in the environmental review. Perhaps, okay, an, easy, perhaps an easier way of thinking about it is whether it's part of the um, mortgage or not. If it's off-site, um, part of a, uh, a neighboring project uh, that's offering this amenity, then it's not collateral. Thank you. On a related note, should the project description include all features of the building, such as a gym within the building? Yes, I would include everything in the building within your project description. Okay, and finally, this is a question for the housing um, program folks on the panel. Would we allow a waiver for asbestos? Uh, we would allow a waiver, but it's uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, and we would have to go into the specifics. We wouldn't waive just in general the requirement to remove asbestos. Okay, thank you. There are no more questions at this time, but again, we encourage um, our audience members to send any questions to daniel.j.sullivan at hud.gov, and we'll be answering them periodically throughout the session. All right, thank you. I think we're going to break for lunch now until 1.15 Eastern time. Yep. All right. Thanks. See y'all then. <laughs>